Have you ever seen a death claw? They're taller than a man and far, far stronger and faster. And there's a whole pack of them out there. You'd have to be the meanest, toughest, roughest bastard in the wasteland to have any chance against them, and I don't think that's you. Deathclaws are arguably Fallout's most iconic enemy. Agile, deadly monsters that can slay even the most experienced post-apocalyptic adventurer. Their design and lore has changed significantly throughout the series' 25-year history, and today we're exploring the evolution of the wasteland's most fearsome foe. Okay, well, it's like a damn big man is what it is. Got spikes and claws that can cut through the heaviest armor. But don't let the size fool you. It's quick. Here's how the Deathclaw appeared for the very first time in Fallout. An almost golden reptilian creature with relatively short claws and horns. Their scale is hard to gauge due to the game's isometric perspective, but they're easily several times larger than an adult human and extremely deadly to players without high-level equipment. Though you're unlikely to actually encounter them until you're at a point when you can easily defeat them. Not much to tell, really. Nighttime scare your children stories about a beastie living up north and feeding on the flesh of bad little children everywhere. There's no lore in the first game revealing where they came from, and the vast majority of characters believe them to be nothing more than a myth. A mystery that only makes them into more terrifying opponents. Fittingly, they are incredibly rare, and as far as I'm aware, they only appear in three locations. The warehouse in the boneyard, the deathclaw's lair, and potentially in a random encounter outside the hub. In the early 2130s, the Master would send out mutants to capture humans from trading caravans, and the Deathclaw at Deathclaw's lair would be blamed for the disappearances. We would also get a hint at the Deathclaw's origin in the warehouse basement, where the player can discover Deathclaw eggs, protected by a very powerful Deathclaw mother. However, looking at concept art in the manual, we can see that Deathclaws look significantly different earlier in development. Starting out as a werewolf before transforming into a bizarre, bipedal lizard creature. Scott Campbell, one of Fallout's most influential designers, revealed how they evolved throughout production. Was it always a big, scaly lizard thing? Nope. My initial design for this terrible creature was the apex predator of the wasteland. A mixture of wolverine and brown bear, mutated by the FEV. It could survive any environment and feared nothing. A legendary force of nature that struck terror into the hearts of men. Unfortunately, the artist took one look at my concept sketch and said, Dude, that's way too much hair. It was true. The wolverine bear was very furry, and there was just no way around it. So here's what happened. The newly formed Black Isle started work on what would be Planescape Torment. One of the first art pieces was a monstrous creature called a Tarrasque. It was sculpted in clay and then point by painstaking point digitized into a 3D model. As Planescape moved forward, it turned out the Tarrasque wouldn't actually be featured in its design, leaving that tasty model in disuse. Thus, the furry wolverine bear became a hairless reptilian biped. Take a look at page 339 of the D&D 2nd Edition Monster Manual. Holy cats, it's a Deathclaw. Lead designer Chris Taylor revealed that it wasn't an artistic design decision that led to their final appearance, however. I'm pretty sure the main reason the Deathclaw lost its hair from concept to production was a technical limitation of the rendering software at the time. I can't remember if it was the amount of additional rendering time required, an animation issue getting all of the hair to move properly or something else, but it was something along those lines. The actual Deathclaw model was done in clay and then scanned by a laser, like the head models, to generate the rough 3D model. It was very Tarrasque-esque, but I don't think that was done intentionally. For the longest time, the statue of the Deathclaw was displayed at Interplay, behind these little glass windows along with props from other Interplay IPs. In the second game, Deathclaws would reuse the model from the first, but we would finally learn their origins in Vault 13, where an herbalist named Joseph reveals they're partially made from Jackson's chameleons. 
However, it's worth noting they're a mixture of various creatures, much like centaurs. As the guide states, Death Claws were originally created to replace humans during close combat search and destroy missions. They were derived from mixed animal stock and then refined by the master, using genetic manipulation. The resulting creature is almost unbelievably fast and powerful. Dr. Schreiber reveals the Enclave needed cheap, expendable soldiers, and in 2235 they would start experimenting on the creature using FEV, eventually resulting in a highly intelligent breed of Deathclaws capable of mimicking human speech like a parrot. After the Enclave captured the population of Vault 13, they deployed Death Claws inside the vault to kill anyone investigating what happened and to cloak the Enclave's presence. However, the Death Claws weren't letting on just how intelligent they had become, and would start their own peaceful settlement. We'd also see evidence of a pack hierarchy as the group follows a single powerful male Death Claw named Gruthar. After experimenting on a captured Deathclaw named Zarn, Dr. Schreiber would realize what happened and plan to recommend their extermination. Two weeks after retrieving the Gek from Vault 13, the player can return to find all of the Deathclaws dead. A recording on the Vault computer reveals that Horrigan returned to massacre Gruther and the other Deathclaws. There are two endings for Vault 13. One where the Death Claws thrive, and another where they're destroyed. By eliminating the Death Claws of Vault 13, you banished yet another species of the realms of extinction, proving once again that genocide is a viable solution to any problem. With your aid, the Death Claws of Vault 13 became a thriving community. When the Vault could no longer hold their numbers, a peaceful campaign of expansion was launched to claim the surrounding lands. However, the positive ending is actually unattainable in the vanilla game due to a scripting error, and the ending where they're massacred is the only attainable option. The positive ending was meant to be attained by fixing the vault computer and killing Dr. Schreiber. The Fallout Bible also revealed that Zarn was once intended to be involved in this ending, stating, According to F2 designer John Daly, Zarn was supposed to go back to Vault 13 and warn the Vault about Horrigan's attack, but he never made it. In the original design, he was supposed to be able to go back and save all of the Deathclaws and warn them about the Enclave, but this didn't make it in. He was last seen wandering east into the waste towards Vault 13. He never made it, however, so his final destination is unknown. It was ironically fitting the good ending was inaccessible, as some of the game's developers regretted the inclusion of intelligent death claws, to the point where Chris Avalone killed them off in the Bible mentioning, quote, BTW, the talking death claws were destroyed at the end of Fall 2. Zarn and Goris did not go on to create a new species. They are gone. Kaput. Goodbye. In fact, any mutant animal that talks can safely be assumed to have died at the end the exact minute that Fallout 2 was over. Any last words, talking animals? I thought not. John Daly would provide a more hopeful outcome that would actually later become canon, stating, If memory serves me right, Goris is not the only intelligent Deathclaw to survive. In the Navarro base, the player finds another Deathclaw that is slated for execution by Dr. Schreiber. The player has the opportunity to free this Deathclaw from captivity. Unfortunately, I can't remember this Deathclaw's name. Zarn, I believe. In any case, there's a chance that two intelligent Deathclaws survive to continue on the species. I realize that they are both males, but that is fine. When they were engineered by the Enclave, the intelligent gene was made male-specific and dominant. What this means is, any intelligent male that mated with a non-intelligent female would most likely produce intelligent offspring. We'd also get our very first Deathclaw companion in Goris, a scholar who disguises himself in robes to travel with you. Goris also has different skin color than the other Deathclaw seen up until this point, and we'd get an explanation for this difference, stating, According to John Daly, designer of Vault 13 and Goris, Goris's skin color was most likely a result of him mutating differently. 
FEV mutates even the same critters with variations. In MODOK, the player can find Rose's bed and breakfast, and the owner Rose sells wasteland omelets made from chicken eggs. It turns out the chicken is actually a deathclaw and the player can kill it, which causes Rose to no longer sell the omelets. Deathclaws would see their next overhaul in tactics several years later, introducing a new variant that's a mishmash of their final appearance in previous games and their original concept art. They'd also be given multiple horns, including a nose horn, and they move completely upright unlike earlier versions. This was a very controversial change to many fans at the time, and it wasn't uncommon to find forum posts like Harry Deathclaws, Whoever came up with that should have been shot. Despite the criticism, this depiction was ironically paying homage to their origins, as Chris Taylor recounted. The hairy deathclaw in Tactics was inspired by the original concept. Plus, we thought it was nifty to show that they're variations and different mutations of the same stock beast. We probably should have had both versions, but that's a decision based on hindsight. Tactics featured a faction called the Beast Lords, a group of tribal raiders who developed psychic powers after being exposed to an unknown form of radiation, giving them the ability to control creatures with their minds. However, the Midwestern variant of Intelligent Deathclaw was too powerful for them to control, and they would capture the matriarch of the Deathclaws, using her as leverage to control the other Deathclaws in the region. The player can save the Deathclaw Matriarch imprisoned by them in the Marden mission, and to this day, she's the only Deathclaw in the franchise that has recorded dialogue. Have you come to kill me? Surely you wish to kill the source of the Deathclaw infestation. Kill me and allow my young a chance at freedom. I cannot live another day knowing I am the very collar that holds my children in bondage. You hesitate. Maybe there is another answer. Maybe you can set me free and allow a mother's vengeance. Free me and I will bathe in their leader's blood and feast on his hot, quivering flesh. If you unlock her cage, she'll talk to you once more before killing the leader of the Beast Lords, Dar. Hiss. At last! I am free at last! My children, you are slaves no more! Duh! I will suck the marrow from your bones! While his name is spelled differently, Dar's name seems to be an homage to a Deathclaw guard of the same name in Vault 13. After killing Dar, she'll say, You fight as if you were from my own brood, warrior. <sighs> My children are now free due to your selfless act. Thank you for your trust. I have much to think about. I would speak with your leaders after I have gathered my brood around me. Afterwards, you can meet the Matriarch again at one of the Brotherhood bunkers where she makes a reference to the film Gremlins and pledges her loyalty. Your elders are wise, warrior. They accept my brood as recruits. My children wish to show their thanks. It is strange time, no? My young fighting with you and the rest of the soft, hairless ones. Treat them well, and don't feed them flesh after midnight. Farewell. At this point, you can recruit Deathclaws onto your team, marking the second and final time that Deathclaws would appear as companions, as well as the only time that they could be directly controlled by the player. There's also a hidden dev note that gives us a bit more information about the mother of the Deathclaws, mentioning, Her real name is difficult to pronounce, so we'll call her Mother instead. Mother looks like an extra-large Deathclaw. She is much stronger, tougher, and deadlier than the average adult Deathclaw. She has a deep, booming voice. Mother's motivation is her broodlings. She is forced to render control of her brood to that of Dar. She resents this, but she has no choice in the matter. Dar would kill her and her broodlings if she disobeyed them. 
As long as she is trapped in the cage, Dara is safe. If she were allowed out though, Dara would be deader than an iguana on a stick. Interestingly, one of Mother's lines reveals that hairy deathclaws have nipples, and are apparently weird egg-laying mammals like a platypus, opposed to their reptilian origins. Tactics would also mark the first time that Deathclaws were really fitting of their name in terms of overall difficulty, and that you could easily encounter them early enough for them to be extremely dangerous. It would notably also feature the single most difficult Deathclaw encounter up until this point, where the Riddick Special Encounter map contains a staggering 18 Deathclaws. I don't think it's ever made clear how the Deathclaws and tactics actually became intelligent, but perhaps they were somehow exposed to FEV like those in Fallout 2. Deathclaws were slated to appear once more in Van Buren, and while they aren't mentioned in the design documents, their model and texture does remain. It's a faithful reproduction of both the sprite in the first two games, as well as the clay model from Planescape. Their animations are also similar to those games, once again using its arms to move in a gorilla-like fashion. There's also an image that shows an earlier, more cartoonish texture that appears to use the same model as the texture that replaced it. Van Buren was built off of the engine of Project Jefferson, Black Isles cancelled Baldur's Gate 3, and there's been some discussion if the Deathclaw texture was recycled from it given its style. I suspect it was simply made for Van Buren, but it would be ironic if the texture was recycled from a game set in the Forgotten Realms given that the Deathclaw was inspired by a D&D creature. The texture would also be reused in an old fan-made game called Adrenaline, where the player fights off increasingly deadly waves of Deathclaws in their underwear. The fight made this big crack in the vault. Bugs crawled in, then the claws. You don't want to mess with them. Some of them are blind, but you have to be real quiet around them. Brotherhood of Steel would introduce several new, bulkier variations of the creature, and many of them run completely on all fours like quadrupeds. They feature serrated spikes along their back, something that was present on the original clay model and in Tactics concept art, but hadn't actually appeared in-game up until BOS and it would become a mainstay of their design. The official guide would finally give us an idea of their stature as well. Deathclaws are just about the nastiest creature that you might have the misfortune to run across in the wasteland. They're fast, they have tough hides, stand nearly triple the height of an average human, and brandish claws that can punch through most armor like a power drill going through wet cardboard. My favorite variation is the Chameleon Deathclaw, which has the unique ability to become invisible. A nice touch considering their origins as Jackson's Chameleons. The Mother Deathclaw seemingly drew inspiration from Xenomorphs and Alien, and is easily the most drastic departure of the creature from its initial appearance. It also possesses the unique ability to heal itself in radiation. Then there's the Adolescent Deathclaw, which is by far the largest variant of the creature in any of the games, and perhaps the single largest creature that's ever appeared in the IP. There's very little lore regarding them in BOS, Essentially, they invaded the Vault Tech corporate vault after a civil war opened the vault up to the wasteland. It's also mentioned that some of them are blind, though there doesn't appear to be any gameplay mechanic related to their lack of vision. In 2006, Interplay contracted Glutton Creeper Games to make a tabletop game, but they had already sold the rights to the franchise to Bethesda. All of the IP's elements would be stripped away as a result, and it was later released as a generic post-apocalyptic game titled Exodus. However, an early preview did show off another cool depiction of the Deathclaw, this one featuring spotted skin and spikes along its back, much like BOS. I was a Brotherhood of Steel outcast. We had a deep patrol out here looking for some tech, and they got jumped by some Deathclaws. They shredded everyone else and left me bleeding to death. If it wasn't for Oasis and Bloomseer Poplar, I'd be dead right now. In the third main entry, we'd see our first 3D interpretation of the monster, featuring tanner skin, back spikes, larger teeth, glowing eyes, and a more malnourished-looking body. 
In previous entries, I was more afraid of their statistics than their appearance. But for the first time in the series, you could really see just how terrifying these fast, hulking creatures really were. And fighting them in real time would add another layer of tension. Similar to the first game, they're often found alone or in pairs, apart from the old Olni location. The Enclave would once again attempt to militarize them by using domestication units to control their minds. But there's no statistical difference between them and the regular variant. In the Broken Steel quest shock value, you can turn them into companions temporarily by using the Control Scrambler, but they aren't very useful when it felt like a missed opportunity. It also introduced the very cool Deathclaw hand melee weapon, which was a great addition. Adam Adelix made a handful of awesome designs for them that are my favorite concepts of the creature. I've got this recipe for a Deathclaw omelet that I've been itching to try out. Trouble is, I need a Deathclaw egg. Kind of obvious, I suppose. In New Vegas, their skin would become darker and be covered in age spots and scars. Their biceps and chest became more muscular, while their neck became thicker. Deathclaws would arguably make their most memorable appearance here, in part due to their extreme difficulty, as they have a higher damage threshold and deal more damage than their counterpart in the Capital Wasteland. While they were mostly fought one at a time in Fallout 3, in New Vegas they appear in packs and can be easily reached at low levels, making them the most dangerous version of the monster in my experience, and leading to quite a few jump scare deaths in my early playthroughs of the game. They'd also be given a more defined hierarchy, where packs are led by an alpha male and the pack protects the Deathclaw mother and babies. While the second game, BOS and Tactics, featured Deathclaw babies, New Vegas would be the first time we saw how fiercely protective Deathclaw mothers are of them. If the player kills one of her babies, the Deathclaw mother becomes much more deadly. Gaining the Psycho Chem effect, which increases her damage by 25%, and the Adamantium Skeleton and Better Criticals perks. Blind Deathclaws would make their return from BOS and amusingly have higher perception than the ones you can actually see. Irradiated Deathclaws that deal radiation damage would be found in Lonesome Road. And we'd even get two unique bosses, Roar and the legendary Deathclaw at Deadwind Cavern. New Vegas would also claim the crown of the most difficult Deathclaw encounter from Tactics in Deathclaw Promontory a location that can feature over 30 of the creatures depending on your level. My great-aunt Rose ran a bed and breakfast back in California, in a town called Modoc. She's the one who created the recipe in the first place. I don't know how she managed to get a hold of a female Deathclaw, but she kept it in a shed. Aunt Rose had a steady supply of eggs for her omelets. At least, she did until some stranger came along and killed the Deathclaw, shot it right in the eye. Rose's descendant Joss Wilkins appears in Sloan, and mentions the Chosen One canonically kill the Deathclaw Chicken in Modoc. If you recover a Deathclaw egg for her, she'll even teach you the Wasteland Omelet recipe for a nice tip of the hat. They'd make their next appearance in Fallout Shelter, and were heavily inspired by their counterpart in the Mojave. Depicted with a similar color scheme and horns, though they did have more pronounced spikes on their back, almost like a stegosaurus. If Deathclaws are mutated Jackson's chameleons, how the heck did they get so big? In Fallout 4, the creature became even darker in color and more dragon-like in their overall appearance. They gained armored spikes and a velociraptor-like toe claw. Their horns grew longer and curved downwards, while their tail was notably shortened. They were also given a handful of new abilities like being able to throw rocks and cars at their opponents. Character artist Jonah Loeb revealed how he reworked the creature, stating, I met my first Deathclaw in middle school, playing Fallout on a friend's machine, and I fell instantly in love with these dragons of the waste. It was an honor to tackle them for Fallout 3, sourcing from both the originals and the concept art of Adam Adelix but I'm proudest of my Fallout 4 redesign. To improve upon their F3 counterparts, I gave the newer ones thicker, more armored skin, shorter, strong-looking claws and hands, a bull-like redesign to their horns, 
to suggest the ability to ram and a thicker tail, heavy enough to act as a counterweight when it ran. It's important to note too, that the Deathclaw is not a mutant, but a hybrid bioweapon created by the US military. To that end, I incorporated chameleons, alligators, bulls, panthers, serpents, and lizards into their design. It features what's probably the most controversial Deathclaw encounter where one can be found and defeated very early in the main quest line in Concord. Though it is worth noting that Deathclaws found later in the world are much more dangerous, and they can instantly kill a player with reduced health and a grab attack. Their movement animations became much more dynamic and evasive as well. For example, climbing and running on all fours, behavior that hadn't been depicted since BOS. Unfortunately, their pathfinding coupled with these animations and size makes it difficult for them to maneuver throughout environments. But overall, I do like many of the changes made to them. The title would also include a large number of other variations including the Chameleon Deathclaw making its return from BOS. But instead of turning invisible, its color shifts between several predetermined colors. Glowing Deathclaws would be introduced as well, who, much like the Irradiated Deathclaw, deal radiation damage alongside their attacks. But they were improved upon by adding a green aura emitted through their skin. Perhaps the most interesting to me is the cut Quantum Death Claws that were intended to appear in the Nuka World DLC. They're visually similar to the Glowing Death Claw variant, but have a teal aura, presumably due to being mutated by Nuka Cola Quantum. They also hit as hard as Mythic Death Claws, which are the strongest non legendary variant of the creature in the game. During the quest The Devils Do, the player comes across a Deathclaw inside the Museum of Witchcraft. After sneaking past it or killing it, you can find a Deathclaw egg that can then be sold for a Deathclaw egg recipe or returned to a friendly Deathclaw. Despite being one of the franchise's most beloved monsters, Jonah Loeb revealed they almost didn't make it into the final game. Well, I knew that I was destined to leave Bethesda before the shipping of Fallout 4, so I tried to jam as much work as I could into those last few months. At that point, I'd made the Super Mutants, the Blood Bugs, the Mole Rats, Preston Garvey's outfit, things like that. But there weren't yet any plans for anyone to do the Death Claws. Design hadn't yet decided if they were going to be including Death Claws in F4 at all, and when I found that out, I realized two things. One, there had to be Death Claws, it was a Fallout game. Two, if I left and someone else made the Death Claw, I would never forgive myself for passing up such a terrifying and massive opportunity. So I started working on the Death Claw and ZBrush from home. I referenced my Fallout 3 versions and mixed together Jackson Chameleon, Alligators, Rhinoceros, Bull, Viper, and for the look in its eyes, I referenced Lions. To me, the Deathclaw is not a rage beast. It's a practiced, cold-blooded predator that lives at the very top of the irradiated food chain. It should always look calm and in control. And Todd, he loved it. I showed it to him when it was about 70% sculpted out, and he gave me the go-ahead to finish it. Two days later, he returned to my cube and let me know that they were reconstructing the demo to include a final power armor versus Deathclaw battle. And we all know how that went. Deathclaws in 76 would mostly reuse the variations from 4, but would be given a new burrowing ability like that of rat scorpions and mole rats. A nice detail considering many lizards burrow as well. In Fallout Shelter Online, we'd get our first intelligent Deathclaw since tactics. In Cura, a talking Deathclaw who asks you to recover one of her eggs from a band of raiders. In her dialogue, she makes a reference that seems to imply she's a relative of Goris, mentioning, quote, I have a distant relative that used to hide his identity so that he could travel with humans. Interestingly, one of the developers on the official Fallout tabletop game wanted to include intelligent death claws, but was reportedly told by Bethesda not yet. Perhaps we'll see their long-awaited return in Fallout 5 or the Amazon TV show, but that remains to be seen. From a hairy bear wolverine to an orange lizard monster, 
then a mixture of both, to whatever the fuck this is, and finally morphing into a demonic mixture of various creatures. The Death Claw went through a more drastic evolution than almost any creature in the series, though the Fluter is certainly a contender in that regard as well. However, I actually love how the Death Claw looks throughout its different iterations, while 76's Fluter is an outright abomination. 